Rage on that beat, going crazy. Other secret societies prospered as well. And some of the historic figures of the past belonged to them. And the fact that these people belong to these secret societies has generally not been acknowledged by the historians who have written the accidental school of history. The theory that the major events happened by accident. It holds that no one really knows why wars, depressions, inflations, etc. happened. They just do. The opposing view of history is called the conspiratorial view of history. This view holds that the major events of the past have happened by design. People planned wars, depressions, inflations, and revolutions years in advance. Before I continue the video, please smash that like button for me. Thank you. One of these individuals was Karl Marx, the so-called father of communism. Mr. Marx had been born into a religious family. His family was Jewish and had converted to Christianity shortly before his birth. Karl was later baptized into the Protestant faith. Marx's first written work was called The Union of the Faithful with Christ, in which he wrote. Through love of Christ we turn our hearts at the same time toward our brethren who are inwardly bound to us, and whom he gave himself in sacrifice. Just a short time later, he wrote this poem he entitled The Pale Maiden. Thus heaven I've forfeited. I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. George Jung, a friend of Marx's during this time, added this comment about Marx's attitude. Marx will surely chase God from his heaven and will even sue him. Marx calls the Christian religion one of the most immoral of religions. Marx confirmed this position that something had changed his mind about Christianity with these quotations from his writings. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of man is a demand for their real happiness. I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above. Something had indeed changed Marx's view of Christianity. He continued. We must war against all prevailing ideas of religion, of the state, of country, of patriotism. The idea of God is the keynote of a perverted civilization. It must be destroyed. As can be illustrated by his own writings, something had not only changed his ideas on Christianity, but something had changed his ideas on what God had taught man through the Bible. Marx was now being critical of God's instructions about how to worship the Creator, how to create a nation to protect God-given rights, why to establish and maintain national borders, how to create the conditions under which all could be free to love their Creator. All of these ideas had a biblical foundation. All of these principles were taught in the Bible. And each of these ideas had been tested by a variety of civilizations for many centuries, but as can be seen from his writings, Marx wanted to war against all of these biblical principles. Something had indeed changed his mind. In addition, Marx had found another bulwark of God's plan for man to be unsatisfactory. He also discovered he had to war against the family. Marx wrote this in his Communist Manifesto. Abolition of the family. Even the most radical flare-up at this infamous proposal of the communists. His bitterness towards the family unit caused members of his own family to suffer as well. Arnold Kunzli, in his book Karl Marx, A Psychogram, writes about Marx's life, including the suicide of two daughters and a son-in-law. Three children died of malnutrition. His daughter Laura, married to the socialist Lafergue, also buried three of her children, then she and her husband committed suicide together. Another daughter Eleanor, decided with her husband to do likewise. She died, he backed out at the last minute. Marx further showed his disdain for the family unit by fathering a child with his own personal maid. She was a gift from his mother-in-law upon the occasion of Marx's wedding. Apparently he found no hypocrisy in the fact that he had a maid at the time he considered himself to be the champion of the working man. Marx railed against the rich and prosperous, those who were wealthy enough to have had maids. But he had one himself. It is possible to understand a small degree of the utter despair that Jenny von Westflin, Karl Marx's wife, must have felt being married to a man who allowed such tragedies to occur. Marx was quoted as writing. Daily, my wife tells me she wishes she were lying in the grave with the children. And truly I cannot blame her. But the historians who have probed Marx's background have generally failed to uncover the reason that he had become so bitter against Christianity and all of its teachings. A few honest historians have uncovered the something that changed Marx's views, and that something was Satan worship. Marx had discovered the world of the occult. Marx had first been brought to the ideas of socialism by Moses Hess, when he was 23. But the most important influence in his young life was the worship of Satan. Many of his friends had discovered this religion before he had. One was Mikhail Bakunin, a Russian anarchist, who wrote. Satan is the first freethinker and savior of the world. 
He frees Adam and impresses the seal of humanity and liberty on his forehead by making him disobedient. Another friend of Marx's was Pierre Proudhon, a French socialist and writer. Marx had been introduced to Proudhon by Hess. Mr. Proudhon worshipped Satan, according to a book about him and his relationship with Karl Marx. He had written that God was the prototype for injustice. We reach knowledge in spite of him, we reach society in spite of him. Every step forward is a victory in which we overcome the divine. God is stupidity and cowardice, God is hypocrisy and falsehood, God is tyranny and poverty, God is evil. Where humanity bows before an altar, humanity, the slave of kings and priests, will be condemned. I swear, God, with my hand stretched out towards the heavens, that you are nothing more than the executioner of my reason, the scepter of my conscience. God is essentially anti-civilized, anti-liberal, anti-human. Here Proudhon declared God to be evil because he believed that God had denied man his ability to reason. Notice that the thoughts of these men were not those of an atheist. Marx and his friends, at this stage of their lives, were not atheists, as present-day Marxists describe themselves. That is, while they openly denounced and reviled God, they hated him while they acknowledged his existence. They did not challenge his existence. They challenged his supremacy. The thing that changed Marx's views about life was the fact that he had discovered the world of Satan worship. There is evidence that he had joined a satanic cult headed by Jonah Southcott, a satanic priestess who considered herself to be in contact with a demon named Shiloh. One of the distinguishing characteristics of his membership in this cult was his long hair and unkempt beard, worn by members of her cult. Proudhon also wore his hair in a similar manner, and it is quite likely that he was a member of this cult as well. Other communists have declared their hatred of God. One, a communist named Flourens, wrote this in 1871. Our enemy is God. Hatred of God is the beginning of wisdom. Another notable communist, Nikolai Lenin, the father of the communist revolution of 1917 in Russia, also voiced his hatred of God and religion. He wrote the following comments. Atheism is an integral part of Marxism. Marxism is materialism. We must combat religion. We, of course, say that we do not believe in God. We do not believe in eternal morality. That is moral that serves the destruction of the old society. Everything is moral which is necessary for the annihilation of the old exploiting social order and for uniting the proletariat. We must combat religion. Down with religion. Long live atheism. The spread of atheism is our chief task. Communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion and morality. Religion is a kind of spiritual intoxicant in which the slaves of capital drown their humanity and blunt their desire for decent human experience. We shall always preach a scientific philosophy. We must fight against the inconsistencies of the Christians. Lenin, like Marx before him, came from a religious family. His father was a school inspector and a devout member of the Russian Orthodox Church. But, at the age of 18, Lenin started reading Karl Marx and soon was expounding Marxist principles. He later wrote. Atheism is a natural and inseparable portion of Marxism, of the theory and practice of scientific socialism. Our propaganda necessarily includes propaganda for atheism. Other communists have joined the attack on religion. Nikita Khrushchev, a Russian dictator who embraced the communist theology during the time he spent at the top of the Russian government, wrote this. Do not think that the communists have changed their minds about religion. We remain the atheists that we have always been, we are doing as much as we can to liberate those people who are still under the spell of this religious opiate. But notice that Mr. Khrushchev went one step further than some of the other atheists. He stated that the task of the communist atheists was to liberate the God-fearers from their God. This, obviously, is the task not only of the communists, but of the New World Order. Others, more recently, have praised Marxism. One even served in a high administrative position inside President Jimmy Carter's cabinet. He was Zbigniew Brzezinski, the special assistant to the president for national security affairs. He was, or is, also director of the Research Institute on International Change, professor of public law and government, and a member of the Russian Institute, all at Columbia University. In 1970, Mr. Brzezinski wrote a book entitled Between Two Ages, in which he made some startling observations on the nature of Marxism. Some of these are as follows. Marxism represents a further vital and creative stage in the maturing of man's universal vision. Marxism is simultaneously a victory of the external, active man over the inner, passive man, and a victory of reason over belief. Marxism has served as a mechanism of human progress, even as its practice has often fallen short of its ideals. Tailhard denotes at one point that monstrous as it is, is not modern totalitarianism really the distortion of something magnificent and thus quite near to the truth. What will probably remain the major contribution of Marxism? Its revolutionary and broadening influence, which opened man's mind to previously ignored perspectives and dramatized previously neglected concerns. 
Marxism, disseminated on the popular level in the form of communism, represented a major advance in man's ability to conceptualize his relationship to the world. Marxism provided a unique intellectual tool for understanding and harnessing the fundamental forces of our time. It supplied the best available insight into contemporary reality. It is one thing to make all of these favorable comments about Marxism, and it is another to actually test the theory against the reality. There are nations around the world that have applied Marx's theories. It is now possible to measure the promises against the actuality. One who has actually attempted to determine the actual practice of Marxism in communist Russia was Robert Congast, a famed British Sovietologist. He estimated that at least 21,500,000 human beings had been executed or killed in other ways by the Marxist communist authorities during and after the Russian Revolution of 1917. Mr. Conquest pointed that out this figure was a low estimate and that the total figure could go as high as 45 million. The revolution in Russia was the first successful attempt to create a government in a nation based upon the theories of Marxism, the victory of reason over belief. China as a nation also experienced a similar fate during its communist revolution of 1923-1947. Professor Richard L. Walker in an official government report released by the Senate Subcommittee on Internal Security in 1971, estimated that the total debt in China might go as high as 64 million. China, too, had experienced the Marxist victory of reason over belief. A tourist who visited China after the United States had established diplomatic relations with that nation in 1973, shared his thoughts about how Marxism had worked in China, in an article he wrote for the August 10, 1973 New York Times newspaper. That article was entitled From a China Traveler and was written by the tourist, American banker David Rockefeller. This is what he wrote about the Marxism in China. Whatever the price of the Chinese Revolution, as many as 64 million killed, it has obviously succeeded not only in producing more efficient and dedicated administration, but also in fostering high morale and community purpose. After reading this comment, the student might recall the statement made by Adam Weishaupt. Behold our secret, remember that the end justifies the means. No one but Mr. Rockefeller knows what he meant by that comment, but it certainly seems to mean that he must have felt sorry for the 64 million Chinese that were brutally killed by the Marxist communists, but the result certainly justified their deaths. He was sorry that 64 million Chinese had to die in the revolution, but it was a small price to pay for efficient administration and community purpose. Don't forget, the end justifies the means. And, the student is not to forget. Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote that Marxism was a victory of reason over belief. Perhaps the best example of someone using reason over belief was the story offered by Whitaker Chambers, a former member of the Communist Party in America, who decided to break with the party and come out from it. He has been quoted as saying. Communism is what happens when, in the name of mind, men free themselves from God. Mr. Chambers had a very interesting break from his beliefs in Marxism and Communism. He related the story in his book entitled, Witness. But I date my break from a very casual happening. I was sitting in our apartment on St. Paul Street in Baltimore. My daughter was in her high chair. I was watching her eat. She was the most miraculous thing that had ever happened in my life. I liked to watch her chapter 16 Karl Marx, Satanist had ever happened in my life. I liked to watch her even when she smeared porridge on her face or dropped it meditatively on the floor. My eyes came to rest on the delicate convolutions of her ear, those intricate perfect ears. The thought passed through my mind. No, those ears were not created by any chance coming together of atoms in nature. They could have been created only by immense design. The thought was involuntary and unwanted. I crowded it out of my mind. But I never wholly forgot it or the occasion. I had to crowd it out of my mind. If I had completed it, I should have had to say. Design presupposes God. I did not then know that, at that moment, the finger of God was first laid upon my forehead. He later added this thought. A communist breaks because he must choose at last between irreconcilable opposites, God or man, soul or mind, freedom or communism. Mr. Chambers had figured it out. Marx, Lenin, Brzezinski and Rockefeller apparently had not. This was everything inside me channel. Please like, drop a comment, share, and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the notification bell too. And please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I will upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. Thanks for watching till the end. Stay safe and healthy.